Welcome to First United Methodist Church. We're glad all of you are here today. What a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord, and it's, it's a good to be together to worship. Our rushers are getting ready to bring the uh, attendance pads down, and as they do, uh, thank you in advance for the information you provide us there. Again, continue to give us your updated email addresses. Many of you in Frankfurt are ch getting email changes, and let us know that new address. We appreciate that information. Even if you've done it before, please do it again and continue to do it until uh, we get it. Make sure you're getting all the email. As we begin today, I want to introduce myself. My name is Phil Hill, and I'm your new pastor. This past Thursday, Bishop Davis made it official, and I'm excited. Barbara and I are thrilled to be with you another year, and uh, it's a joy to be in the house of the Lord. A couple of announcements that I want to lift up to you. Uh, the Todd House re uh, roof repair has started, so there's going to be some disruption over the next month or so. So if you're coming to the office and the door's closed, there might be another opening that you can come in. So uh, just be patient with us as we get that new uh, roof done and uh, take care of that. That'll be great. And we thank you for your patience on that. A couple of other announcements that I want to lift up. Uh, don't forget uh, uh, activities happening all week. We've got some meetings tomorrow morning or tomorrow noon. Our brown bag Bible study will be here at the church. Trustees, you guys are meeting Tuesday night at uh, seven or 5.30, excuse me. And then, of course, on Thursday night, lots of things happening. We've got everything from tennis to worship to outreach. So it's a big Thursday night uh, at First Church. Be a part of all the great activities happening here, and uh, you'll be glad you did. Let's stand and let's greet one another. You may be seated. It is great to be in the house of the Lord and give thanks for the many blessings. Sorry about the sound problems. We're getting them worked out. Um, who knows? It, it goes with the sermon. It's an adventure, so we'll figure it out. <laughs> but let's, worship, let's prepare our hearts now to worship the Lord.
please stand as you're able for the call to worship. God called Abraham and Sarah and promised to bless them. They obeyed and received God's inheritance. God called Isaac and Jacob as heirs to that promise. They too followed in faith, seeking God's realm. God calls us to join them and be heirs with the faithful. We come here in faith and are assured by hope. Please remain standing as we sing, sing hymn number 529. We gather today and bring to this place our common concerns and needs. We bring our individual uh, desires and concerns as well. And so it's fitting that we now go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. Mighty and loving God, as we gather in this place today, we join our hearts in, unite, in united praise and glory of your wonderful name and through the name of Jesus we give thanks for the blessings that you pour, poured out upon our lives. We humble ourselves before you, O oh God. We know that we're not always what you want us to be, but our desire, O oh God, is to be your church and so we seek the purity that you can only bring through the blood of Christ. Forgive us of our sins. Renew our faces and let our thoughts and our deeds and our, and our words always reflect the abundant love of Christ for us. We thank you, O oh God, that as we gather today, we can be your church. And we want to be the church not only in this place but outside these walls that reach out to those that are, that are hurting and needy. Lord, we have the greatest news in all the world to proclaim. 
And we know that there are many who are hungry to hear it. Bring among us, O oh God, the ability to share your, your hope and your help. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your healing touch among those that are sick and hurting. In our hearts, we know there are many, family, friends, neighbors, people we know, people we don't know, all around the globe who are seeking the healing of Jesus Christ. And today, O oh God, we seek that same healing and use us where necessary, Lord. Use us for the glory of, your, of, of the Lord in healing. We know you're our comforter. And today we remember so many in our lives that have touched us in powerful ways that are no longer with us. But you, O oh God, fill the void left within us. And your love overflows. And for that we give you thanks. Oh God, uh, as we go our, on, our li on our daily lives, as we take this pilgrimage of faith, there are many decisions that must be made, both about our personal lives and about us as a church, us as a community and nation and world. And we pray, Holy One, that we will sense your wisdom. May your blessing come upon us. And may we always be in your will. Now, Lord, bless us. Bless those who protect us and provide the freedom and liberty we enjoy as we, enjoy, as we share now the prayer that you taught your own disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, thank you. I'm going to invite our children to come forward now. Good morning. Everybody doing all right today? Good? Yeah. Today we're talking about uh, how God calls us, and sometimes God calls us to do some important things with what we have and who we are. I was thinking about some people in the Bible that God called. You ever heard of Noah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, Noah. God called Noah to do what? He was supposed to what? He built the ark. That's right. And, uh, Saved all the animals and everything, and uh, that was a pretty big deal. I mean, I can't imagine God calling me to build the ark. I mean, that's a big ship, you know. And God called other people to do things. God called me to be a preacher. And, um, you know, I wanted to tell you how God did that. He did that through my dad. Um, sometimes God uses our parents' voices to talk to us. And it's really important that we listen to them when they speak. My dad asked me one day, he said, Phil, do you think God's calling you into ministry? I didn't think much of it at the time, but later I realized that God was using my dad's voice to call me, and so today, here I am. Every one of you is talented in something. You know that? Some of you are good at math, and some of you are good at writing, and some of you are good at running. Some of you are good at, um, well, I don't know, doing all kinds of things. Some of you are cook, good cooks. And uh, I've, I've tasted some of your cooking. It's pretty good. Some of you are good at talking. That's, me. That's you. That's Miss Helen. I love you. And, and that's okay. You know, someday you may be. There are people needed to talk and to talk important words of wisdom. And someday God will give you that gift. God blesses all of us through our parents and our families, through our church. Our church to us, our, those people, all these people out here have said that they're going to help raise us as well, take good care of us. And so when they tell you, quit running in church, it's just like your mom and dad saying, quit running in church or something like that. You know what I'm saying. Anyway, the point is, is that we love you. And we want to encourage God's call upon your life. And that's really important. You'll learn more about that as you grow older, but it's something to talk to your parents about today. What do you think God is calling me to? Let's pray. Let's pray, okay? Dear God, we thank you for our, our time together with our children, and they're so important to us. And we do know that you are calling them. We may not know to what, but we're learning every day. So bless them, their families. Bless us as a church as we surround them. And uh, may your love and grace always be upon us. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. I want to ask the congregation to stand and let's sing together the last three verses of number 508, Faith While Trees Are Still in Blossom. Verses 3, 4, and 5. Be seated. Let us pray once again. 
Oh God, we do thank you for your word, and now as it's revealed, we pray that the meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth will be acceptable to you. And we pray this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Philosopher John Gardner once wrote an article entitled, The Need for Rebirth in American Spirit. And he writes there, he says, the truth is that we've dug ourselves into a hole. It's going to take all we have of spirit and dedication to fight our way out. Like an athlete returning from a lazy summer, we must get long, unused muscles back into shape. All Americans must join together to fight cynicism and restore the values that our, of our, in our family, the community, and the workplace. What's needed is the resurgence of spirit on the part of the American people. Today, I want to take us back into our series we were doing, Restoring Lost Values. And I want us to look at restoring the spirit of adventure. You know, growing up, I loved to go to new places. I loved to eat different kinds of foods. I loved to try new experiences. And as an adventurer, it often got me into trouble. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. You can ask Barb for more information, but I'm known for just saying, let's turn over this drive, go this way. And Anyway, not long ago, I got a piece in the mail. Maybe some of you got it. It said, Passport to Adventure. And I thought, all right, I like adventure. So I opened it up rather than just throwing it in the trash. And, and, I, and I opened it up, and there were about 100 coupons to the mall. I'm telling you, my, honestly, my idea of adventure is not going shopping at the mall. Maybe it's just me. You know, most people in our country today, though, we... we we try to stay far away, as far away from danger as we possibly can, right? I mean, we get out of the pool when a thunderstorm comes. We avoid dark alleys in big cities. And we never, ever, never, ever take the tag off our mattresses, right? <laughs> now today, I want to suggest to you that it's not crazy uh, to push the limits. It's crazy not to. Somebody has said the spirit of adventure is the spirit of civilization. When you remove it from civilization, you start to decay. What is causing, my friends, our spirit, our spirit of adventure to decline in our culture today? I think a couple of things. It's just an opinion. You can agree or disagree. But I think over the last 30 years or so, we've been asking our government to remove all the risk of our society, which has made it safer and safer, but much more bored, boring. Actually, I think most of us live our lives like we watch TV. The program's not all that good, but we're too lazy to get up and find the remote and change the channel. And that's not the way that God intended for us to live. Get out your note page for a moment. I want to show you something. In John 10, verse 10, and I'm using the amplified version of the Bible today. I like the way, the way it says this verse. This is really neat. This is Jesus talking, and in John 10, verse 10, it says, I came that you may have and, that's a big and, and enjoy life, and have, and have it in abundance to the fullest till it overflows. Now, friends, I want you to notice this. God says life is meant to be enjoyed, not merely endured. Here's the message, friends. We were made for adventure. If you look again in John 10, at verse 10, it says that we may have and enjoy life, that it will be in abundance, that, it will have, that we will have it to the fullest, and that it will overflow. Now, honestly, friends, does that define your life right now? To the fullest, overflowing, in abundance? Living on the edge, grabbing the bull by the horns. Does that describe your life? Some of us have to say, well, no, not really. Sometimes my life is like the old Geritol ads. You all remember that? How we had that iron poor, tired blood. Remember that? Got the heartbreak of psoriasis. I'm glad some of you remember that. You younger folks can look that up on YouTube, but anyway... But the question becomes then, how do you live life to the fullest? How do we make, friends, the, best, next, the rest of our life the best of our life? How do we do that? From this moment on, how do we make it the best of our life? There's a word, a key word in the Bible for that. It's called 
Faith. Faith. The biblical word for the spirit of adventure is faith. And faith is what makes the difference between living and just existing. The greatest collection, my friends, of adventurers in the Bible is found in Hebrews 11. And if you've got a Bible, you can turn into it there. And I've got the scripture in your note page as well. But in chapter 11 of Hebrews, we find the hall of fame of God's faithful. It's, a, it's kind of a who's who of adventure. A who's who of risk takers. A who's who of who uh, that made their life count. And so this morning, I want us to take a look very briefly. And I'm going to move through this quickly, so stay with me. I want to look at four men. Noah, Abraham, Abel, and Moses. And from these, men's, these men, from their lives, we can draw, I think, principles that can make our lives a real adventure. Let's check it out. How do you make your life adventure? Number one, on your note page, number one. You have to obey God immediately, even when you don't understand it. Obey God immediately, even when you don't understand it. Let's talk about Noah for a minute. In Hebrews 11, verse 7 there, it says, It was faith that made Noah hear God's warning about things in the future that he couldn't see. He obeyed God and built a boat in which he and his family were saved. The words faith and obey, do you see that in the scripture there? They go together. Imagine that. Imagine that. Think about your own life for a minute. Jason, you're a very talented man. But what if God came to you and said, Jason, I am not happy with the way the world's going. I'm going to start it over with your family. I'm going to flood this place, and i got a favor to ask you. I want you to go build a boat, big boat. And uh, I'm going to bring all the animals. We're going to get on that boat with you. And I, we're going to ride it. And it's going to be the adventure of your life. Wouldn't you have some questions? <laughs> Wouldn't you have some considerations like, uh, I don't know, uh, Lord, where are we going to put the termites? You know, I don't know. Where, where do you put the termites? I don't know. But not Noah. Nope. Noah obeyed immediately. He didn't gripe. He didn't complain. He didn't ask any questions. He said, okay. Would you? And we know the story of Noah, and we know what an adventure he had. Look at the next verse, verse 8. And he talks about Abraham. It was faith that made Abraham obey. Wow, there's those two words, faith and obey. When God called him to go out to a country, God has promised to him. He left his own country without knowing where he was going. Again, there's those words, faith and obey. They're right there together. They go together. Abraham was 75 years old. Some of you remember when you were 75, right? Yeah. Some of you are looking forward to getting there. 75 years old. God comes to you and says, you think you're ready for retirement? (laughs) You're ready now for the greatest adventure of your life. Pack your bags. (laughs) Pack your bags. We're getting out of here. We're moving to a new place. Now, let me give you a little history here. Um, Abraham grew up in in what is now Iraq uh, in a town there called Ur, Ur of the Chaldeans. Can you imagine living coming from there? Where are you from? Ur. (laughs) You you okay? Yeah. Well, where are you from? Ur. Okay. Anyway, so he packs up his bags and he leaves Ur, and uh, they head out west. And, and, and the only thing Abraham said is, how will I know when I get there? And God said, I'll tell you. Now, Abraham didn't complain. Abraham didn't argue. He didn't question. He just went. He obeyed immediately, even when he didn't understand. That's faith, my friends. And that's what will give your life a great adventure, I promise. Let's go on to number two. The other way we become faithful is that we give generously even when I don't have, have it. Give generously even when I don't have it. Why? Because giving and faith go together. And God will use our finances at times to test us, if you will. I don't know about you, but have you ever had to decide between paying a bill and paying your tithe? Probably have. We all probably have at one time or another. But it's a test. God uses this, uses our finances to test us. And it's interesting that as you read in Hebrews 11 in this Hall of Fame of the, Hall of Fame of the Faithful, 
The first guy that gets mentioned gets mentioned there because he gave an offering. It wasn't what he, what he gave, it was how he gave it. His name was Abel. Remember Abel, the son of Adam and Eve? Uh, remember, you know the story, right? Adam and Eve, they, they, had, they left the garden and they raised Cain. Just checking, just seeing if you're awake here. Wake up, David. Okay. <laughs> anyway, they raised Cain, the son, and then they had another son named Abel, right? Okay, yeah. And uh, Abel gave an offering, and his offering was better than Cain's, and God blessed it and, and anointed it, and, and that's how he got in the Hall of Fame of Faith. Now, why was that? It's because he gave it in faith. That's so critical. Notice this verse. Look at Hebrews 11, verse 4. It was faith that made Abel's offering to God a better sacrifice than Cain's. Through his faith, he won God's approval as a righteous man because God approved of his giving. Now, I want you to notice here, it wasn't what he gave. It was how he gave it that pleased God. And there are really only two ways that we can give in life. You know, everybody's either a giver or a taker. And even in that, there's two ways that we can be givers. One is by reason and the other one's by revelation. Let me explain that. If I give by reason, I simply look at what I have and then I kind of figure out what I can afford and then I try to give that. It doesn't take any faith to do that. Just look at what you got. People who don't even believe in God give that way all the time. But the second way by revelation is it makes it an act of worship and an adventure. When I give by revelation, I simply pray, Lord, you've got many resources, more resources than anybody in the world, and yet you want to give something to the world through me. What do you want to give through me, Lord? How much do you, God, want me to trust you for? See, that's giving by revelation, friends. It's not, it's not based on what I can afford, but what God wants to give, and, and we trust God to provide that, and then we give it. Now, to bless us, God requires one thing, and that is faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Giving is not a debt we owe, my friends. Giving is a seed that we sow, and you've done that many, 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 many times. In effect, God comes to us, and he says, let's see who can outgive the other. Notice this verse in 2 Corinthians. It said, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever uh, sows generously will also reap generously. God is able to make it up to you by giving you everything you need and more so that there will not only be enough for your own needs, but plenty left over, for you, uh, over to give joyfully to others. God says, if you want to live a life of adventure, obey immediately even when you don't understand and give generously, even when you don't have it. Everybody get it? All right, let's go on. Number three, trust completely even when I don't feel like it. Trust completely even when I don't feel like it. And the example that we use here is Moses. Trust completely even when I don't feel like it. In Hebrews 11, verse 24, it says it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called Pharaoh's grandson. What? He chose to suffer with God's people instead of enjoying sin for a short time. He thought it was better to suffer for the Messiah than to have all the treasures of Egypt because he was looking for God's reward. By faith, he left Egypt and wasn't afraid of the king's anger. You all know Moses? Everybody know Moses? Moses' life? It was one of the greatest adventures ever written about, I think. Remember the story? He, Moses, Moses was a Hebrew child. Got put in a little basket in the river, and down he went. And Pharaoh's daughter found him. You know that story? She raised him, raised him as an Egyptian. Anyway, uh, he was raised as an Egyptian, but he was a Hebrew, a Jew. And it says that after he had grown up, he came into maturity, and he made, had to make a decision. What am I? Am I an Egyptian or am I a Jew? Now to say I'm an Egyptian would mean, friends, that Moses was going to have fame and fortune and pleasure and prestige and all those things that we all strive for every day. But if he said I'm a Jew, he'd have to live in the Hebrew slaves in poverty with no guarantee of anything else. In fact, Moses said, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to trust God even when I don't feel like it. 
and he chose to go live with the slaves. And because of that, God gave him the greatest adventure he could ever experience, the greatest adventure anybody maybe has ever had. But you see, if Moses had made the wrong choice, he'd have ended up being an Egyptian mummy, mummy stuffed in some museum right now that you and I had never even heard of. How many, how many of you have ever heard of Moses? How many? Anybody here? Yeah. Why? Because he did what God wanted him to do. Even when he didn't feel like it. Do you hear me? And that's maturity. Spiritual maturity. And that's what we're really talking about today. Want to grow up? How to grow up? You see, the truth is, friends, I, I don't want to hurt your feelings or mine either, but you know, the truth is, I don't always feel like doing the right thing. There are times that I don't feel like being nice to people. Do you? Am I the only one here? I mean, I don't always feel like putting Barb's needs before mine, right? I, I don't know. This, oh, this, I don't always feel like reading the Bible. And I don't always feel like praying. And I don't always feel like giving. And I don't always feel like forgiving people. I don't always feel like doing the right thing. But you know what, friends? Feelings are highly unreliable. And God says, look, don't base your life on your feelings. Base your life on faith. And that will make it an adventure. You want to be successful? I told the kids at Western Hills High School at their baccalaureate the other night, at, the se at their seniors. I told them, I said, you want to be successful? Successful people simply do things that unsuccessful people are unwilling to do. Successful people are willing to pay the price. If we will trust God, my friends, even when we don't feel like it, God will give us the strength to pick ourselves up even when we feel like throwing in the towel and giving up. Now you might say, well, Phil, gosh, you know, I wish I had faith like that. I wish I had the faith to obey immediately when I don't understand it. I wish I had the faith to give generously when I don't have it. I wish I had the faith to trust God completely when I don't feel like it. How do I get that faith? Well, there's two ways, very quickly. It's in your note page. Here's number one. We get that faith. God builds that faith in us through His Word. Through His Word. Write that down. Through His Word. Through the Bible. Very simple. As we read it, as we study it, and we memorize it, God helps us become more like Him. And He builds our faith. Number two, God builds that faith through testing it. Through testing. God tests our faith. We've been studying 1 Peter in our brown bag Bible study. 1 Peter 1 verse 7 says, There is a wonderful joy ahead, even though the going is rough for a while down here. These trials are only a test, only to test your faith, to see whether or not it is strong and pure. It is being tested as fire tests gold and purifies it. And your faith is far more precious to God than mere gold. So if your faith remains strong and, you're, and, and after being tried in the test tube of fiery trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day of His return. Did you hear that scripture? Here's the deal, plain and simple. God tests our faith through difficulties. Do you ever have problems? Do you ever have stresses? Do you ever have crises in your life? God tests you in that. God tests our faith through demands. He asks us to do the impossible. Remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about the feeding of the 5,000. Impossible to do. But God asks us to do that. Even when we don't understand. God tests us through our, tests our faith through giving our dollars. God uses delays to test our faith. Remember we talked about that a few weeks ago about how sometimes there's a delay. And some of you right now are in that delay period and it's driving you crazy. But friends... When you pray that prayer, and God's going to answer that prayer. Sometimes we don't heal like as fast as we want to heal, right? Sometimes the decision for that new job doesn't come as quickly as we think it ought to. Sometimes things just don't happen. But in that process, friends, our faith will grow. So let me ask you, are you doing anything in your spiritual life right now are you doing anything in your spiritual life that requires you to take a risk? Hmm? The Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. 
Are you doing anything in your Christian life that requires you to step out in faith? Hmm? The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith is what makes the difference between existing and really living. From going from a life bored to death to going through life with the greatest adventure. Faith turns life into the greatest adventure that you could imagine. William Carey used to say, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. So what is God trying to say to you this morning? Hmm? May I say on His behalf, go for it. <laughs> I think that's what God is saying to us. Go for it. When we know it's the right thing to do, when we know that God is trying to impress upon us a, a, a guidance, and an action, we need to go for it. I mean, look at this church. In the 225-year history of this church, it's been all about taking enormous risks, stepping out on the edge of, that other churches were unwilling to do, and watching God do something miraculous along the way. God's doing something in this church, my friends, not because we're unusual people, but because we have chosen to believe in God and to have faith in the Lord. I tell you simply this. An invitation is being issued to all of us to come get on board. And if you're on board, that's great. Go out and find some others to get on board with you. Because the future is going to be great. I don't know what the future holds. But I know who holds the future. And it's going to be an adventure. God guarantees it. Let's pray. Lord, uh, we know that you do plan for us great things. You will bless our faithfulness. And so as we come to you right now, as we celebrate and worship, as we offer our gifts and we sing and pray, may, O oh God, your blessing be upon us this day as we go for it. And we do what you need us to do. Thank you, Lord. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. We respond to the word in a lot of ways. One of them is in our giving. Our wrestlers are getting ready to come forward now. So let's prepare ourselves to offer our gifts and our tithes to Almighty God. can give generous, generously even when we don't feel like it and we hope that you will accept these gifts in the spirit in which they're given. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
remain standing. Let's sing together out of our hymnal number 507. Through it all. Let's sing it through twice. We thank you, mighty and holy God, for this gathering today, and thank you for the challenge you give us to trust in you. And now as we go from here, give us that peace, peace that passes all understanding. And we pray it in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you, and let's sing together before we go. God be with you till we meet again.